All right, let's go ahead and <clears throat> get this kicked off. Uh, today, I will be talking to you about capacity planning uh, using tools within Kubeflow and machine learning. Uh, if some of you may remember, I spoke, uh, I think it was at Detroit, where I had a similar talk where I was talking about using statistical modeling uh, for capacity planning. Uh, this is very similar to that. I'm actually gonna brush over a little bit of the content that I shared um, about how you can use things like Six Sigma and different types of statistical models, uh, and then how that then eventually goes into using machine learning models. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I work at Red Hat. I've been there for about six years now. Uh, originally, I was an architect with NR Services, uh, mainly focused on like Fortune 50 US companies, so a lot of automotive and healthcare. Uh, I have recently moved into AI, um, so my background is actually in machine learning. Um, that's why I, I really enjoy more of the, the metrics and um, uh, a lot of ways to observability and ways to use metrics to solve problems. So, um, yeah, I've been, been there for six years. Uh, this is my sixth KubeCon between North America and um, EU. So some of you may be familiar with me. If this is your first time hearing me speak, excited to have you here. So I want to st start off with a, a problem statement. And it really comes down to capacity planning um, for Kubernetes. Uh, this was done, I think, back in 2022. It was a survey of different um, CTOs. And over 50%, or nearly 50%, were struggling to keep their cloud costs um, <clears throat> within the original estimates. Uh, there was a new one of these that was actually just published recently that I think this number has actually gone up closer to about 60%. Uh, especially as these prices have been increasing. Uh, so there is definitely a need. Um, I know, I think even uh, CNCF recently had an article published about um, the need for more capacity planning as well because of these rising costs. Um, I always like this quote. Uh, you know, the major myth of cloud computing uh, is uh, cloud computing is less expensive than on-premise. and At the end, it depends. Uh, that depend factor really comes down to how you do capacity planning. Um, <clears throat> when I was consulting for different Fortune 50 companies, there was kind of the myth of that cloud reduces price. Um, very, very rarely did I see that, um, especially as you start scaling out horizontally. But there are ways to bring down costs through um, with good capacity planning. I'm gonna be sharing a couple of those here and then how machine learning kind of fits into that mix. So these are my four managing, uh, examples of managing resources, kind of the four do's of, of uh, capacity planning. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest issues I see is people just not understanding their applications. Uh, I'm not gonna dive too much into this, but it does fit into capacity planning because if you don't understand how your application works, you're going to run into issues. Um, it's like throwing darts like I have here. You know, you're, you're gonna try to get lucky um, and you may end up either spending way too much money or you may underutilize your resources and have um, you know, failures and boot loops and, and things you don't want to be notified on a Saturday night at you know, 11 p.m. Uh, auto scaling fits into this. I'm not talking about auto scaling today, but know that auto scaling obviously is very critical. You know, when do you trigger auto scaling within your capacity planning? Um, not running performance tests, and then here, uh, number four is the biggest one I'll be talking about today. Is you know, making sure to calculate your your uh, resource metrics, and then making sure that you're continually recalculating those metrics. Um, and understanding how your application works and how it consumes resources. So I'm gonna show some examples without machine learning. <clears throat> this is an example of an application I pulled um, over the course of, I think, 24 hours. 
um, showing different CPU average for um, a variety of pods running the same service. So this is a load balanced application, but it's the accumulation of the two. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what a Z-score does. Um, so here we have a, a, a PromQL, and <clears throat> this is calculating really the, the variety of change. Um, so if those of you who are not familiar with statistics, um, it's really giving a magnitude of, of how often something has changed and what is the variety of it. Um, I, I have a, at the end here a blog post where all this is available on my GitHub as well. So I know some of you are taking pictures. Just know that you also can access that directly. Uh, so here's an example of what that Z-score looks like. Uh, a lot of times in uh, observability, we use Z-scores to for, for alerting purposes. Um, something has changed. Something um, something is happening either for good or bad. It could be that an application is erroneously consuming resources or you have more users than you were expecting um, and you just need to respond to it. So using Z-score to understand when things are changing is critical, not just for like statistical method, but you could even use this for machine learning where you use this in combination to know um, when you need to be changing your capacity planning. So anytime you see this score going up, it means it's, there's, there's something happening from a, a capacity standpoint. Um, the way that I've calculated uh, f requests, um, and, and just for fun fact, when I originally gave this talk, I was also talking about limits in Detroit, and then I had a mob of observability people afterwards waiting for me in the hall and had to educate me on why limits are bad. <laughs> And uh, so, so I learned, uh, and so I'm no longer talking about limits here. Uh, this is a way that you could then determine things like requests. Um, the example that I have here is a, is a two sigma. You might be familiar with six sigma um, in statistical processing. Same thing, we're just taking two of those sigmas based off of the average. And what we've found in capacity planning, and there's some research along these lines too, is that um, around two sigma is around where you're gonna hit that sweet spot for a request. Anything more than this is overkill. Um, I, the example that I always give, I was working with a healthcare company and I was brought in to do some capacity planning with them. And um, we had everything worked out, we had some estimates of how much they were gonna be spending. Uh, we, we deployed, they call me, uh, about a year later, and they're like, Chris, we're spending four times what we were expecting. Something's going on here. This isn't good. Can you come and take a look? So I come back, I take a look, and I realize that all of their teams were requesting four gigs uh, of memory and uh, four CPUs for all, for all their applications. <laughs> and I asked why, and they're like, well, we just didn't know what to put in there, so we put in a safe value. We, we, we took in the maximum amount of, uh, you know, if, if they were even doing that, they were just taking the maximum amount and saying that's our request. We always want to have that available. That's not how Kubernetes works. That's not a good plan. You will spend a massive amount of money. Um, so you can do something like here, where I'm using a statistical method to determine a request. Um, and here's an example of that. And as I said, I'm going to show you the link to the... And this is my blog post on that specific part. So the, what I talked about in Detroit, um, this blog has all the information on um, that statistical method. Uh, now, this is, this is a great method. Machine learning should not replace this. Uh, I'm sh what I'm showing you today is more something that can complement it as you're doing resource planning. So now let's move into the machine learning side. So I like to use a model called long short-term memory when doing capacity planning. Um, if you are a data scientist, uh, 
just like I have the observability people in the back ready for me from the limits, I have a feeling the data scientists might do the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I do like this particular model. Um, some of you may be familiar with the transformers model uh, that's being used in Gen AI. It does something very similar to um, this particular model, but I find that this model is easier to work with and actually works really, really well for the type of um, statistical type of modeling and prediction and gradient um, that we're trying to create um, when we're doing capacity planning. Uh, so it, recur it uses recurrent neural networks. Um, so if you're looking at your screen uh, up here, um, that's the part that it kind of feeds back into itself. Um, G the Gen AI, like LLMs, do the same thing. Um, they just do it with a, a different approach. Um, this one is, like I said, a little bit easier to, to work with. Um, and then the things on the bottom are what we call gates. I'm not here to, to explain the in-depths of, of, uh, <laughs> of machine learning, but these gates are what keep the, um, keep the memory going. Like, does, do we need to forget this particular piece of information, or is this information pertinent to the model? And it just keeps repeating itself over and over again with the data. Uh, like I said, this is easier to implement over a transformer model, especially in this use case, and it's a very highly stable model um, over just a playing RNN. Um, the, a, an RNN typically fails often um, when you're dealing with a lot of different data um, this normalizes that data, and because it's repeating itself and has those different gates, um, that normalization helps it make sure that it stays stable. The process here would look something like this. You would have your Prometheus, Prometheus data feeding into the model, and then you would use that model to calculate your, your, your prediction. Um, when you're using time series models, um, you're typically predicting pretty close. Uh, so it's not like I'm predicting in, in six months. I'm usually predicting in a day or two. Um, the, the more far, further out you get, the less reliable the model becomes. Um, and that's why, uh, this is actually why it's not as pertinent to use in things like Gen AI. Um, it's, it's usually interested in like the next in the series. Um, and then through that information, you can modify your resource capacities. You could set in your deployments your request, um, or you could use this information to update your alerts around, um, <clears throat> around the types of services that you're monitoring. I, I've talked a little bit about some of these challenges. I'll just kind of glance over it. Uh, there is a loss of accuracy over time. I did mention that. Um, like I said, you wouldn't predict what your resources are going to be in six months. It's going to be what's my resource plan for tomorrow or next week, more likely. Uh, this does take a lot of data. So this is the chicken before the egg problem. Uh, so you would need to make sure that if this is a greenfield application, that you're using some type of testing and performance environment to start get some early benchmarks of what um, your capacity planning is going to look like. Uh, it doesn't predict seasonal changes. So if you're like a retailer and things pick up around Christmas uh, or Black Friday if you're in the US, uh, this isn't a good model for that. Uh, this is looking more for um, changes changes in, in your data consistently over time. So if you have more users who are continuing to use your application, or maybe you have less users, maybe someone's using a new API and there's a decrease and you want to reduce that request, um, this is perfect for that type of workload. Um, it shouldn't replace traditional methods. Uh, you know, using Statistical modeling is still a very powerful tool, and it actually is probably what I would do first. Um, this is just a way that you could add on to that uh, and build more understanding of how to do capacity planning. Um, this one's fun because it's very visual, and I'll show you a demo here in a moment. Um, so if you were presenting to, let's say, stakeholders 
on why maybe you need to change your requests and maybe your your um, and operations and you're requesting more uh, more equipment, maybe this type of thing would be good to to show long term increase. Um, and with that, I think that is the demo. So let me switch over to that. This is a Jupyter notebook. I'm not going to go into the nuts and bolts of this, but it's basically a way to interface with different machine learning um, libraries, uh, typically in Python. So the code you'll see here today is in Python, uh, and it's using a library called PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch is usually more for experimental, non-production environments, um, usually for research purposes, where TensorFlow is usually the one that people use for like production models and so forth. Um, so this works well for me because I'm just showing a demo. But just know that all the big um, data science libraries will have um, <clears throat> an LSTM library. So here I'm bringing in the Prometheus package. Uh, and just so you know, this cluster isn't up anymore, so don't try to hack me. <laughs> And uh, I'm here, I'm pulling in the data. Uh, in this case, I'm doing segments of two hours. The reason why I did that is because I only had this cluster up for about three weeks, and the data <coughs> worked better at two. But you would probably do it in segments of like an hour or maybe 30 minutes. Um, that's where you'll probably get better optimal results, or you might do a day, or you might do half a day. It really depends on how you want to quantize the data. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, I got the best results for myself at you know two hours. Um, we do a transformation of the data. I won't go too much into this. This is just getting it into the necessary data structures. Um, here I'm loading the data. I actually saved the data here because just in case we didn't have good connection or wasn't able to, to reach out to that cluster, um, I already have some data here. So I know it's how I want it. So all this is doing here is normalizing the data. <coughs> uh, when we work with data in um, <coughs> machine learning, we're typically wanting values between um, either zero to one or negative one to one. Um, so all this is doing is transforming the information into um, values that work best for the model. This is just creating the data structure. I'm not going to go into this. Um, just know that this is what's defining the model. Um, the nice thing about uh, <coughs> LSTM is that it's optimized for CPU. You might get some slightly better results on a GPU, but it's not like an LLM where um, some of them actually even require GPU to do the training, or you're just not going to get an order of magnitude you know, improvement. So just know that if you want to try this out, you don't have to have a GPU on your cluster. This section here is going to start the training. I have 100 different iterations. Um, I'm not going to go into the nuts and bolts of, of what these values mean, but the fact that it's increasing here just tells me when I need to cut the, um, the learning or modify the different parameters. So here I'll go ahead and show you what the results look like. Um, this is based off of the training data. So we would expect this to be very, very close um, to the model. So we, we use this data to train the model, and then we're just replugging that information back in to see how it correlates. So if this wasn't accurate, then I would know something was <clears throat> very off. Um, and this is right now in that normalized form. So I think it was like, 0.049 CPU that I was using on average. Um, this is a normalized uh, negative one to one version of that data. And we will change it back into the, the format that we had the, to, that will be applicable for our scenario. Uh, and then let me real quick go. 
Um, this is just doing the same thing with the test data. The test data here was the, the last five days that I, I removed um, and just put it into test. So this, the, this data was not used to train the model. This was the last five days um, after the, the training data. This is the test data. And you can actually see we get some pretty accurate results here. Um, <clears throat> it may not get it exactly, but it actually gets the trends, which is what's probably most impressive. And that's actually what's most valuable for us when we're doing capacity planning. We want to understand our tr trends, we want to understand our valleys, our, our slopes, and have a good understanding of how our applications are, are consuming resources. Um, so uh, I didn't have enough time today with this segment to show you how you could tie that all in, but the way you could do that, it would be to have like a pipeline. So Kubeflow has Kubeflow pipelines. Um, and then Open Data Hub, which is the, um, the Red Hat uh, like upstream version. Um, we have the same thing, but we use Tekton under the hood. Um, so you could actually set up pipelines that are updating um, <clears throat> updating this information, you know, you could put it into a new alert or you could have it even updating um, like your requests um, through that pipeline as well. I wouldn't recommend that for production, but it might be a good way for like in your development environments to be keeping track of, of different resources. So this is one way that you could do this. You would have to rerun this pretty frequently as you were getting new data. Um, and revising this model as new trends are formed. But it is a good way to see, in this case, uh, this is about, like I said, about five days worth of data, um, get an idea of what those trends would look like. So uh, with that, I am open for questions. Uh, right here. And the microphone for questions is over here. If anyone Hello. Is okay. Um, hi, my name is Flaviano Christian Reyes. Uh, I work at Bloomberg. Um, kind of a two part. So, one, um, is this deployed into some like production setting um, for other teams? And two, um, what was your production SLA? Like how fast did you have to calculate the next um, time series value in order to action on it? Yes. Yeah, so typically you would find this deployed in a performance test environment. Um, you, or, or you would be pulling in, in like an experimental, um, so you, it, it's possible that the capacity planning team has their own cluster that they're using for testing and then they could pull down that data from production. Um, from what I've done with this deployed, I have not deployed this in production yet, um, but the example I gave at the beginning I have, and the way I did that was through um, a custom alert monitor. So the, the Prometheus would have its own PromQL, and then when it triggered, <clears throat> I could then tie that back to like an alert monitor. I've also done it with CADA, where CADA <coughs> was configured with a PromQL for the, um, uh, the Z score that I showed earlier. And you could do something similar to this. Um, like I said, this is very experimental right now, more for information, but yes, you could find ways to deploy this into production. All right, can I just like get a ballpark estimate for how long the model took? To uh, I mean, we, we ran it with two weeks of data and that took just a couple of seconds. Okay. If you're talking about maybe six months worth of data, um, you're, you're not talking more than maybe one to two minutes. It's, it's, not, it's not like an LLM where you're training for days. Um, and I trained that on you know, pretty moderate amount of CPU. I think it was capped at like two, two to four CPU. All right, thank you. Yep. Hello? Hello. Uh, I'm Sally, uh, working for Get Your Guide. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions that I have was how does this would work like a GitOps-based approach since we are kind of mm, right-sizing the resources in place, would you recommend like a feedback loop that opens a PR, like how automated can we get this? Yes. 
So once you get past the experimental phase, which I just showed with like a Jupyter notebook, you could put that into like, let's say a Tekton pipeline. And then that Tekton pipeline would just run the model. And then you would have that all defined in GitOps. That's actually the, the example that I gave the gentleman just a moment ago with the statistical side. That's exactly what I did. I had all within Argo and managing everything through Tekton pipelines and different mon like alert monitors and um, you know, different like jobs that were running to keep, keep that going. I think we're at time. Um, uh, we can take that, the questions offline. Thank you.